Um, hi, um, it's it's great to meet you all virtually uh, this year, I guess. Um, and um, yeah, I, I uh, it's it's a real pleasure to 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 talk to you all. Um, I, I've talked to uh, Mark's previous in previous years now. I guess this is this is the third time, Mark. I think. I think maybe yeah, maybe so. Maybe even more. Maybe it's yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, more, yeah. okay. So just a little bit about me. Um, uh, I'm um, I'm a uh, professor adjunct in uh, MBMB at Yale. Uh, I teach a writing uh, course there. I also do workshops for graduate students. Um, my main work is as a journalist um, and um, as a um, <clears throat> and and as a uh, uh, um, uh, columnist for New York Times and writing books. So I was going to talk to you about, um, you know, some of my adventures. Let me just share the screen. There you go. Um, all right, great. So can everybody see my slides? All right, cool. So um, let me just make this. All right. So um, so uh, yeah. So so. Um, I, I, what I want to talk to you today is sort of a compliment to what Mark was just talking about and really sort of looking at um, genomes from sort of a, from a sort of popular social side of things because um, they are, genomes are really, um, you know, fascinating scientific objects, but um, they're increasingly a, a, um, a social object. Um, they are, are, are a, they're part of our, our economy. Um, they they are things that people talk about at parties. Uh, they're they're not just um, data on a screen. Uh, this is a, a a chart that kind of gives you a sense of just how uh, uh, big uh, personal genomics has become. This is a, just a chart going. This goes up through 2020, showing people who have gotten their DNA tested. Obviously, this is genotyping, not whole genome sequencing, but still, like people are are looking at their DNA, and they were not able to do this a decade ago, in any large numbers. And uh, <clears throat> the total uh, as of 2021 is 37 million people uh, from these uh, doing it from these services. This is a lot of people, and it's going to continue to increase. So, what are these people getting uh, for? you know, giving the money for this, uh, this service. Well, they're getting very um, complicated and sometimes confusing pieces of information. So this is a sample of what uh, a company like 23andMe is providing, um, you know, explaining about this variant in, in uh, Epsilon 4 uh, uh, for, uh, and then in the APOE gene. Um, so you you know it says so what do you what do you make of this if you're told you don't have the variant that we tested, well you know hidden in there is like well there are actually other variants that you could test for and there are other genes that play a role with Alzheimer's and then there's lots of other uh, other things about Alzheimer's that we can only kind of sort of understand so um, so you know people are. Uh, People are reading this stuff, and they're 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 bringing to this to messages like this what they understand or what they want to believe about their genome. So so that's all very complicated. And so if you you know someday end up in the business of uh, consumer uh, genetics genomics, um, you have to bear that in mind that like there are people on the other side of what you're doing. Um, this is another kind of thing that uh, these companies are delivering. Um, they are providing um, inferences of ancestry, uh, and people really love this stuff. Um, you know, what does it mean that your ancestry comes from something like this? Uh, does, you know, what, which of these circles matter to you and don't? And what, how are you going to define uh, your heritage based on this kind of information? Um, probably has a lot more to do with um, your own cultural views of heritage in general and these particular uh, places than it has to do with uh, statistics and looking at particular variants that are common in particular places. Um, and you know, the, one of the reasons that, um, that these companies are booming and making so much money uh, uh, with these tests is that 
they can um, they can play on on our our notions of what is in our genome. Um, this is a still from an ancestry ad that's been on recently. Um, and uh, you know if you it's if you go look up like ancestry winter sale greatness, you know the, I, mean, I can leave the slides with Mark, but it's kind of mind blowing because you have this figure skater who's skating around and the narrator is basically implying like, oh, if you get this ancestry test, you'll discover where your excellence comes from. Now, I don't know if her figure skating comes from Scandinavia or Central Asia, I don't know, but the, the implication is there that there's a value to understanding yourself in the things that you're doing and the things that you're working hard on in your own life, somehow that like you, you owe it to your your genes uh, and you know your Scandinavian genes, maybe. I don't know. It's it's a very these are very problematic ads, um, which make a whole bunch of uh, assumptions about the relationship between genotype and phenotype. So um, I I really have been quite fascinated with uh, a lot of these issues for a while now, and so um, I I. Uh, Mark showed a, a series that I did uh, in STAT called Game of Genomes that kind of emerged out of that. I took some of that information, that experience and other research, and it went into a book uh, I came out with a couple years ago called She Has Her Mother's Laugh, which is a, a broad look at heredity. What does heredity mean? What does science tell us about heredity? Why do we think of heredity in, in other ways? Um, and so, um, you know, if you, the things I want to talk about, I'm drawing on from this book and from that stat uh, series, um, and also some of my more recent reporting, actually some that I just finished very recently. Um, so, um, uh, you know, for a lot of people, you know, the, the idea about heredity um, goes back to what they learned in high school about Mendel, where, you know, you have this, you know, um, kind of one gene, one trait kind of view of things, recessive and dominant alleles. Um, and, um, you know, th this was, it's, it's kind of hard to uh, appreciate that for a long time um, in the early 1900s, like this really was largely the view of genetics, that there was a gene for, for every trait. Um, and that, uh, and that you could explain uh, even human nature based on sort of these uh, single gene approach. Now that doesn't mean to say that that humans uh, are totally like you know above Mendel, um, and uh, you know there are some some conditions that really follow M Mendel's rules very cleanly. Um, Huntington's disease, for example, which is a, a disease of the brain that the folk singer Woody Guthrie died of. Um, follow this follows this rule, and in the early 1900s, uh, scientists. Um, were able to, to, to determine that there was, there was a gene. They didn't know which gene it was. We know what it is now, it's called HTT. So there's, there's one gene and there's one region of the gene where if there are mutations in this area called the CAG repeat, um, you can have Huntington's disease uh, emerge and be passed down as, as a dominant trait. So you just need one copy of the disease version of the gene uh, to, to develop Huntington's disease. We know that HTT encodes Huntington. We know the structure of the protein, exactly how it is that the mutation changes the protein and then changes its function so that it leads to uh, Huntington's disease is a lot less clear and, and consequently um, there's no cure for it. Um, but um, you know, it is possible to do a, a predictive test you know, uh, are you going to develop Huntington's disease? Um, and and it, it's it's a pretty straightforward thing, again, because there's one gene and it's dominant. There's some subtleties in it, but, you know, compared to other things, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Of course, when there's no cure, you know, a lot of people who have parents with Huntington's disease don't actually take this test um, because they feel, well, what do I do with this information? So that's another thing to remember, like, as you're finding this information about people's genomes is like, think about that person, what it, what that information will mean to that person. Um, is it something they'd rather not know? Um, or, or, or if they, if they take that information in, are they going to be able to understand what it means for them? Um, 
So, so in, in, in recent years, um, you know, people have uh, been getting very, very interested in this kind of approach, looking at your genes to understand your uh, proclivities to disease and so on. And it's uh, driven in part by this incredible crash in, in the cost of genome sequencing. Um, first genome, the, co the cost, which was roughly 20 years ago that they published the first draft, it's about $3 billion, if I correct, recall correctly. Um, this chart just shows, uh, NA, from NAH, shows you on a logarithmic scale, I'll point out, just how dramatically uh, the cost has crashed. By comparison, Moore's law is uh, what, you know, now allows me to like have uh, way more computing power on my phone than sent astronauts to the moon in the 60s. Um, but, and yet, you know, cost per human genome totally blows that away. So, so we really are in this incredible revolution where now human genomes are within our grasp. Um, so a few years ago, when this was still um, kind of a new thing, um, I took advantage of an opportunity through Illumina to get my genome sequenced. It was, they were sort of doing a promotion and having meetings where you could, uh, they, they would sequence your genome and have a clinical geneticist look at it. And, um, and then you go to the meeting and they talk about the promise of clinical genetics. As you can imagine, it was sort of a way for Illumina to try to make business. Um, and, um, but it was very odd getting the results back. Um, again, like I say, like, um, you know, what, what I got back was uh, mainly just a report. Um, and uh, this report, you know, they, they looked for path, you know, disease causing variants. These are Mendelian traits that I was talking about, like Huntington's. And, you know, this is what they said no pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants. Um, so that's that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, like I did have, you know, a couple carrier uh, variants so that in other words, recessive, recessive diseases. So if, you know, if my, my wife also had the same variants, you know, chance that our kids would have very rare genetic disorders, but we would have known that already. Our kids are 17 and 19. So, um, so, you know, as a journalist, it's kind of underwhelming. Um, so Illumina, you know, also offered other ways of, of, uh, of looking at, at my genome. So they, they, are, they created this browser here, which, you know, you can imagine that anybody aside from a geneticist is not really gonna be sure how to make use of it. Um, and then they would pick out things that they thought were kind of cute, um, things not related to disease, but um, really, you know, the communication didn't really quite succeed. Um, you know, you're there at the top, your odds of developing male pattern baldness are increased if you're Caucasian. So I am Caucasian, I'm, I'm not bald. So what do I do with that? Um, you know, your muscles are built for power. I don't think that's true in my case. So, you know, I mean, so, so, so here, here was their effort, which I don't think was very successful. So, um, so I uh, decided to get my hands on the data itself, which actually turned out to be rather hard because um, Illumina had done this basically as a, essentially as a medical test. So uh, you're not actually allowed to get the raw data in a medical test, uh, strictly speaking. But as I described in the book, I found a way around that. And one day a hard drive showed up um, and I had my, um, my genome. So I went to people like Mark and said like, here it is. Um, I want you to help me make sense of it. I want, I want to learn about how scientists study genomes and, and, and how heredity works by looking at, at, at one genome in particular, mine. So there were lots of interesting things. Um, uh, you know, for example, <clears throat> we, we think about disease causing variants. Um, fortunately, I didn't have any like, you know, single gene Mendelian type one uh, variants that cause disease. Certainly had some that, you know, ra raise my risk of various things um, in a sort of a complex uh, fashion. And then there were actually genes that are beneficial. 
Um, so I have a variant of a gene called IL-23R and I have a lower risk of certain autoimmune disorders because the variant I have in this gene, um, which is involved in immune signaling, um, it, it, it sort of tamps down um, the signals that immune cells send to each other so that it's less likely that it's gonna spiral out of control and that the immune cells are gonna start attacking me, um, my own tissues. Um, so I, it was great to hear that I had that, I had that protection. Um, and it was a, it, very interesting that around this time, a drug called Cosentix, which you might see on ads on TV, um, was coming on the market, which was developed through learning about this gene and about the effect that uh, mutations like mine have on it. You know, so the other thinking was like, oh, look, people with mutations to IL-23R, certain mutations um, are at lower risk. Why is that? What, what's the mechanism there? And can we then um, mimic that with a drug? So, um, so there it is uh, out on the market. Um, I also was, you know, interested in sort of the, the ancestry side of things. Um, and, you know, the, the, this is my brother, Ben, and, and um, he uh, got um, a, a 23andMe test, I believe. And so he had, um, you know, he had sort of a, a genotype type test. So he had like, you know, a million, or I forget the number, maybe a million uh, 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 steps, markers, from his, his DNA that were, were identified. Um, and that was enough for um, Yanni Verlich and colleagues, um, they had a, a company called DNA.land um, to just take a look and show us um, how, how our chromosomes show that we're related. Um, so you recall, you know, meiosis and recombination so that, um, so that my brother and I do not share identical genomes, even though we have the same parents, but we do share very long stretches of identical DNA uh, because there's only been, you know, essentially, you know, one generation of the shuffling of DNA um, before producing gametes. So, you know, when you see something like this, a comparison between you and someone else, you know that they're closely related to you. Um, so that's, you know, like I, I didn't need that to know that, but it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> this is a portrait of another relative of mine, not my brother, but um, this is a Neanderthal. And um, I and pretty much everybody on earth is related to Neanderthals. In fact, are, are actually direct descendants of Neanderthals. Um, and the reason for that is that Neanderthal, the ancestors of Neanderthals and humans split off about 600,000 years ago, probably in Africa. Uh, the Neanderthal lineage spread out uh, into uh, Europe and Asia, um, and over the next couple hundred thousand years split into two big lineages, one called Neanderthals in Europe and Central Asia, one called Denisovans over in uh, Eastern Asia. And then much later, um, there was one particularly big wave of humans, uh, modern humans that emerged, expanded out of Africa um, and encountered <clears throat> Neanderthals and Denisovans, interbred with them. And Neanderthal genes and Denisovan genes entered the, the modern human gene pool and have been passed down ever since. Um, and through uh, you know, migrations and contact with people, um, Pretty much everybody has certainly has Neanderthal DNA, including Africans, because there were reverse migrations back into Africa thousands of years ago. Um, <clears throat> Denisovans, you know, um, very their DNA is very common, uh, particularly in New Guinea, less so in East Asia, um, also present in Australia. Um, it's somewhat in, in Native Americans, not so much in Europeans or, or Africans. <clears throat> so um, so uh, showing this on a tree, this is a very simplified version of the tree, but you can see that you, know, you have the branches of humanity and then you have the contact between different branches and a flow of genes. So that if you wanna look at your, your ancestry, um, you know, you're gonna to have to take into account that um, you know, your ancestors uh, 
some of them uh, encounter Neanderthals. Um, Neanderthal ancestry um, can be as little as 0.1 or 0.2% in Africa, up to 1%, 2% among most people. It can be a little over 2%, um, I believe, in some places, but for the most part, you know, maybe 1%, 2%. Um, but, you know, it's a, we have big genomes, so that can encompass a lot of, of DNA. And because of recombination and, and such, um, my fragments of Neanderthal DNA are different than yours. Uh, and so just because you have like 1% Neanderthal DNA doesn't really mean anything. Two people can have 1% Neanderthal DNA and have an entirely different Neanderthal genes. Um, so people have wondered, well, why, you know, why, why do we still have Neanderthal DNA when all, so much has been lost? And, you know, the idea is that a lot of it um, was not favored by natural selection. It, it got in the way of having kids if you were a modern human. They didn't really fit our biology. But some of it did stay, and, and it's possible that some of those genes stayed because they provide an advantage. So um, I, I got a couple of researchers at Princeton to kind of go through and check out my Neanderthal DNA. You know, they sort of mapped it on my genome, and they even gave me a list. I mean, this is just the beginning of the list. I have over 700 Neanderthal genes. You probably do too. Um, but, you know, I mean, this is very cool, but on the other hand, <clears throat> you know, if I look at the top of the list and say, oh, MIR7846, that's great. I have a Neanderthal version. What does that mean? Well, um, for a lot of these genes, we don't even know what they do in humans. Um, and for very few of the ones that we do know how they work, we don't really know what the variant in Neanderthals means as opposed to the modern human one. So this is kind of a sort of a down payment on, on what we're gonna learn about ourselves by looking at our Neanderthal ancestry. Um, and you know, you have to bear in mind that um, it's gonna be, for a lot of these genes, the, the influences, they could be important, but they could also be quite subtle. Um, and that's because, uh, and this is one of the gonna be one of the hardest things to get across in sort of consumer genomics is that, um, you know, some traits are like Huntington's disease, but a lot of traits are like height. Um, and I write about height in my book. Um, scientists are really interested in height. They've been fascinated by it for centuries. Um, a lot of times they just were very curious about people who were very tall and people who are very short. But with the advent of, of um, sort of early studies on heredity in the 1800s, um, it was possible to actually quantify the heritability of height. In other words, tall parents tend to have tall children, short parents tend to have short children. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule, but there's a relationship there, a correlation that you can measure even before you know what genes are involved. So in my book, I write about Joel Hirshhorn, an endocrinologist, pediatric endocrinologist, which meant that he would meet a lot of times with parents who had very short children. In other words, they were not having as much of a supply of growth hormone as other kids. And you know he would assure their, their the parents that they were their kid was perfectly healthy, just of a particular stature, and then they would want to know well why is our child so short? And then he would have a awkward pause and have to say like well you know you're you're not that tall yourself. And then they would talk about genes, and then it became clear, and this is in the 1990s that um, he had no genes to talk about. He would just say like oh they're just genes associated with height. And after a while, this, this spurred him to actually look for those genes. Um, and he did uh, use a process called genome-wide association, which basically you just take thousands of people and, and look for statistical connections between certain variants and certain genes and height. Is there, you know, it does having a variant, um, you know, change even slightly uh, the average height of, of a group of people? So this is, was, has been very hard work. It took years and years and years to come up with uh, one variant on one gene. Um, it took almost 5,000 people to study. And this came out in 2007. Uh, three years later, they had 180 genes uh, based on 183,727 people. 
2014, almost a quarter million people, and now they're up to almost 700 variants. 2018, almost 700,000 people, and now they're up to 3,290 variants. Uh, and last year, they got up to over 4 million people, and now they're closing in on 10,000 variants. Um, so just bear in mind, there are only 20,000 uh, protein coding genes in the human genome. <laughs> so, um, so it's starting to look like a whole lot of the human genome is involved in height, in a, in a, either directly or indirectly, but in a way that you can measure by studying the genome. So we're, we are learning about height by studying you know, what genes influence it um, and why height is heritable, but we're starting to realize that height is uh, incredibly complicated. You know, think about it, like well, um, the fact that your, your body grows in a coordinated fashion and then stops. I mean, that's kind of marvelous. Um, and, and this just gives you a glimpse at how much of your biology has to be involved to have that happen. And of course, we can't forget that even though height is highly heritable, um, if I give you, you know, um, your height, you know, your height genes, if I give you a report of, you know, 10,000 genes and so on, um, there's still a lot that's up for grabs. Uh, and it's important for people not to look at traits as being utterly fixed by genes. Um, just to give you one example, here's data from women in Canada and the Barbados in centimeters. So clearly these Canadian women are substantially taller than the women from Barbados. And so you say like, oh, well, I guess it must be the genes that they inherit. Um, they, they, they largely come from different ancestries. And so that must be it, right? Um, well, the catch is this data comes from 1896. So what happens if we jump forward hundred years? <clears throat> well, by 1996, um, both groups of women were taller and actually the women from Barbados were even taller than the Canadian women. So, you know, you, you can't look at um, a trait, even if you know it's uh, highly heritable and say, well, it's fixed in the genes. Um, the genes are, are playing out in an environment. And, and this is really, uh, this is, you know, in, in addition to sort of polygenic traits, I think this kind of interaction between the environment and genes is just gonna be really difficult to get across um, as more and more people get their genetic information. I certainly struggle with it as a journalist. Um, just to wrap up and then I'm happy to take questions. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the neat things about getting your genome sequenced uh, is that, um, you, you know, if you know how to uh, analyze it, or if you know people who know how to analyze it, um, it's a sort of a never ending resource because as people <clears throat> learn new things about our biology and our genome, you can, you can query your own genome and, and learn things about it. Um, you know, 23andMe continually sends updates to its customers saying like, hey, guess what? We've discovered this, we've discovered that about, about genes and you have this variant. Um, Surprisingly, COVID-19 has um, presented us with a new opportunity. Um, uh, so, you know, we think of COVID as just being a, a disease caused by a virus, and it certainly is, but, um, and it's, it's worth getting to know the virus. And this is a couple articles that uh, I worked with with my colleague, Jonathan Coram. But, you know, why is it that some people feel like, you know, barely even know that they're sick. And some people end up like this patient, um, you know, needing oxygen, uh, being on a ventilator, maybe even dying. What's the difference? You know, why, why, how do we explain it? Is it, is it just luck or is it something else? So scientists have been making lots of comparisons. I'll just show you one example of, of this where um, <clears throat> in, in uh, United Kingdom, they uh, took advantage of their national health care system and a, and a large um, a medical database there. And they were able to, uh, you know, looking at um, millions of people were able to sort of come up with these kinds of, of risk ratios. So, um, you know, 
just to pick out a couple, like you know, being a man puts you at higher risk. Uh, you're you're having a high BMI puts you at risk. Being older puts you at risk. Um, you know, some of these uh, there there is a uh, you know there's certainly a genetic component to them. Some of them, it's social. Um, you know, there's something very problematic at the very top to say ethnicity black. Well, what does that mean? Um, you know, obviously, like uh, we can identify diff different uh, eth uh, the ancest different ancestries for people from different ethnic groups, but um, to be black or to be white is to have an experience in a society. Uh, you inherit not just some genes, but you inherit um, the social system. Um, so if if you have been if 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 you have been redlined into uh, a neighborhood uh, where all the factories are blasting out pollution, guess what? You're going to have uh, you know more respiratory disease, high blood pressure, and so on. Um, and it would be a mistake to say, oh, it must be in these people's genes when it's history. Um, so all that being said, it, uh, geneticists said like, okay, well, can we just look at the genome and find uh, uh, risk factors for severe disease? Um, and this is sort of the same process like they used for height. Um, and um, very early on, one, one result really popped out on chromosome three. Um, there are a bunch of different genes in the neighborhood of this marker, so it's not entirely clear which gene is responsible for this signal, but it's a strong one. Um, so if you have a certain variant, uh, you are, are far more likely, if you get COVID, to get severe disease. It turns out that, um, it turns out that, that the variant that causes high disease, uh, high risk of disease, severe disease, is from Neanderthals. Uh, and we know that um, because um, you know we're 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 able to uh, uh, scientists are able to, to dig up fossils and and there are bits of DNA in them, even 70, 80, 100, 150 thousand years ago, they can sequence that DNA and they can actually build whole genomes. So we have several Neanderthal genomes, um, and so. Um, so this is an article I wrote over the summer about the discovery of this of this variant. Um, why you know a Neanderthal variant would make you at much higher risk of severe COVID? Nobody can can say that, but um, you know, but it is interesting that a lot of Neanderthal uh, genes that have survived in us are involved in the immune system in one way or the other. It could be that Neanderthals. We're regularly getting viruses out in Europe or, or Asia um, that were not present in Africa. So then when Homo sapiens expands out of Africa, they start encountering new viruses and they may not be as well defended against them as the Neanderthals were. So people who inherited Neanderthal genes for certain uh, kinds of immunity, you know, might have had a better chance of surviving that virus and of having kids. Just a hypothesis at this point. But what's uh, uh, interesting is that a paper just came out um, by the same uh, two researchers, uh, and they, you know, they've been looking around some more. And on chromosome twelve, they found another variant um, that uh, is involved with COVID. Um, it may involve uh, a gene called OAS three, which I'm showing here. And um, so this is actually a a variant they found that can protect you from severe COVID. So that if you have this variant, you're less likely to get really sick. And interestingly, OAS3 just so happens to be one of the proteins we use in our uh, immune system. Um, it's it, uh, our, our, All of our cells make it and it, the protein can recognize and lock on to double-stranded RNA, which um, which is produced uh, by a lot of RNA viruses. Our cells don't make double-stranded RNA generally. So if the cell, if the OAS3 and other proteins come across double-stranded RNA in the cell, that's a bad thing. And so it sets up a whole cascade of things to basically um, alarm the immune system. The cell might commit suicide, all sorts of things happen to protect us from getting sick. So if you have the Neanderthal version of this protein, maybe, 
um, that may be protecting you from COVID-19. Maybe it uh, helps your immune system to be better able to detect COVID-19 and wipe it out early. So, um, you know, I, I thought, well, gee, I'm gonna be talking to you guys. So, and this stuff has just came out. So I wondered what was in my genome. Uh, and, uh, you know, it turns out that um, I don't have the variants that increase risk. I, I'm uh, heterozygous for the ones that decrease the risk. So I think that's good. <laughs> I don't know how much that uh, affects my, uh, my odds of getting sick from COVID. I'm still going to get vaccinated, um, but it is intriguing to be learning more about this one particular aspect of, of heredity and what I've inherited from our very, very, very distant ancestors. Um, so um, just wanted to, to give you that kind of a tour of, of all the things that people can find in their genomes. And, uh, you know, I, I, I will look very much forward to your rummaging around and trying to find uh, new things, surprising things. Uh, you know, Mark, Mark still has my genome. It hasn't changed uh, since then. My genome is my genome, so um, yeah. So so I'll look forward to hearing what what you find out, found out, and happy to answer some questions.